everyone, welcome back to Hannah White White and Friends, the podcast about living abroad. If you live abroad or you love to travel or you are interested in different countries and cultures, this podcast is for you. Also, if you always wanted to live abroad but you haven't found the courage yet, this podcast might inspire you. Just follow me on Instagram or hit the bell button in Spotify to get updated on new episodes. Listen to Hannah Worldwide and Friends on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Hi everyone, please welcome with me Thor Pedersen from Denmark, the man who wrote history by traveling to every single country in this world without using an airplane. Thor was thinking about an adventure which could last him four years, but he ended up spending a decade to complete his mission. Welcome, Thor. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so you. much. <laughs> Thank you for that very kind introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time. I'm feeling so honored that you are having some time after having so many interviews and news and morning shows to attend to. And yeah. Welcome. Yeah, it's been pretty busy. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be a part of your podcast. I have to be honest, I was a little bit selfish. Yes, I have a podcast, but I'm also so unbelievably interested in your story. And I have already checked out your Instagram page and I was already looking at a lot of stuff. So I know a little bit more than everyone who is listening, probably. Um, <laughs> so <good>. I will <laughs> still leave you to tell me all about you pretty much um, but first of all how did that idea of traveling to every single country but not using an airplane how did that start uh, well I'll, I'll answer that in a second I just first I want to say you know it's it's probably better to talk to someone who's interested <laughs> than to talk to, okay, to to talk to someone who was just told you have to talk to this person <laughs> and they did no research and they don't care so yeah. i appreciate that you scrolled through instagram a little bit and did some research it started in well the, you know you can you can maybe say it started in two different places or two different times so if we go way back i would say it started with the books that I was reading as a child and uh, the stories wow. that I was was told and that all of that stuff made me want to have an adventure you know like <laughs> reading about Robin Hood or reading about Mowgli in the jungle book and so yeah. I, I wanted an adventure and then I would go into the forest and I would pretend that I was Indiana Jones <laughs> or that I was <laughs> someone like this and then when I got older I was really really interesting I, I remember getting a book about uh, I think it was a hundred great adventures or something like this and I could read about the the adventure when they tried to explore the North Pole the first to go to the North Pole and the first to go to the South Pole and the, trying to conquer the highest mountain in the world when they discovered that Mount Everest was the highest mountain and then there was yeah. like a race to be the first to go on top and then of someday I, I realized everything has been done. It's, there's <laughs> nothing left. You know, the, <laughs> what's, what's left for the rest of us? You can never be the first. It's, it's, it's impossible. So many people have lived on this planet and so many people have done so many crazy, crazy things. Uh, today, more than 6,000 people have been on top of Mount Everest. Can you imagine that? You have yeah. more than 500 people have been to space it's, it, the the wow. world has changed so much. And then if we fast forward to 2013, I got an email from my father and there was a link and I followed the link and I was reading about people who had traveled to every country in the world. And cool. it, this was the first time I realized that you could do that. I was... 34 years old and I had been to 50 countries in my life and uh, this was through work and when I was younger school and holidays and 
but 50 countries and I was 34 and that cost a lot of money <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and, and, and it took 34 years. So I thought, okay, there are more or less 200 countries in the world. Yeah. You, I mean, how can you do that? That's impossible. You cannot go to every country, but more or less 200 people in 2013 had been to every country in the world. And I, I was just intrigued. And I found out that no one had done it completely without flying. And yeah. then I saw that's the my chance. Yeah, that's my opportunity <laughs> to do something and be the first. Yeah. Um, but I was 34 and I had a wonderful woman in my life. And I just yeah. invested in an apartment. I had a 12 year career in shipping and logistics. There was like all my friends had their firstborn child and some were waiting for their second. And yeah, it was I felt it was too late. Um, but then slowly it it progressed. Yeah. yeah. So that idea grew on you and you thought like, no, I have to do that. <laughs> yeah. And in, 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 yeah, that's a, that's a, that's very accurate. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so that's what happened. Yeah. I really love how you always call your wife your super wifey <laughs> because mm. as you said, you just were in a really good relationship and yeah. then you ended up being on the road for 10, nearly 10 years. That's like yeah. insane. And I would not know any woman other than <laughs> your wife who would say, okay, That's your dream. You have to do it. I will support you. Like, yeah, well, we didn't think it was going to be <laughs> 10 long. years. And, you know, it's, I, I don't know what people they think. I, I think maybe some people imagine that she was just sitting near a window looking out <laughs> <laughs> waiting for 10 years. Yeah. But, but you know, this, this was a decision we made together. My, my, my wife, um, I call her ultra wifey, ultra right. wifey. Right, not that. super wifey, ultra wifey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and the reason why is because I think I heard someone in Australia use the term wifey and I thought that sounds so cool. That sounds nice. Oh, wifey. Yeah. Yeah, it's just my wifey. <laughs> So I started to call her wifey also on social media and some women got upset and said, you cannot call her wifey. Do you know the real meaning of wifey? Wifey is someone who's just in the kitchen and doesn't have a career. And they said, no, no, that's not what I mean when I say wifey. I mean, this is yeah. a woman I love. It's just a nice little nickname. And then uh, she came to visit me in Hong Kong during the pandemic. I was stuck there for a long time. And we did this ultra trail together. So if you do a distance, which is more than 50 kilometers, it's called an ultra distance. Right. And we did a 100 kilometer trail together. Uh, in, in, and then I upgraded her to ultra wifey. <laughs> that's so cool. So, so that's the reason. But yeah, no, in, in 2013, she was, uh, she was finishing her education, becoming a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, she knew that she was going to spend so much time studying and preparing and that she didn't really have time for a relationship. Uh, so in some way, it was kind of Perfect. a good solution for her <laughs> that she can be in a relationship, but not have the hassle of having someone <laughs> nearby. <laughs> It's awesome. And, and then she wanted to pursue her PhD. And she knew that also the PhD would be super demanding mm -hmm. and, and take a lot of her time and her energy. And also it wasn't like a, a good thing to do and, and be in a relationship so again this was pretty perfect and we thought it would take four years maybe three and a half years before I would come home and then we could be in a long distance relationship <laughs> and we could see each other she could travel and we could be together in at exotic destinations and of course we can have video calls and and, and messages and you know we thought this would not be yeah. we thought it, it made <laughs> sense <laughs> then, of course, four years went to five years, five years went to six years, and then eventually nine years, nine months and 16 days. Yeah. Oh, my God. But when you were thinking to maybe once you're back, having like a long distance anyways, and her following her dreams or going overseas or traveling around, then it's kind of perfect as well that, 
I mean, it definitely had its challenges, I'm sure. But yeah. having that, okay, it's a little longer than four years, but she can still do her thing and she can build up her career. And um, yeah, it sounds like it was just really what needed to happen. Like, you know, everything happens for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, yeah, I think we got the best out of it. And and what a lot of people maybe don't really understand, it's also hard to understand, is that we we feel that we got closer to each other in spite of the distance. Yeah. So we're really good at communicating. And uh, we have these unique experiences also from all the visits. She made 27 visits to me around the world. Yeah. And uh, the, we joke and we say that uh, some people, they say that if you want to test a relationship, then you go to <laughs> Ikea together, right? And, <laughs> and she came to Sudan and she came to Jamaica and she came to Armenia. So, you know, that's, that's better than the Ikea test. Yeah. Uh, we, <laughs> we have so many good memories from, from India and from Australia and from Hong Kong and from all around the world. Yeah, I think especially when you are like a traveler mindset for both of you, it's mm. so much more to actually go and travel together and spend so much time then together. I sometimes can't even spend that much time with a person I haven't traveled with. Like you never really know what challenges you will face when you're actually 24-7 no. together. You can't escape and it's probably yeah. the best test. <laughs> It's it's good because maybe you're very organized and the person you're traveling with is losing things all the time and forgetting things. Yeah. Maybe you want to start your day at five o'clock in the morning and the other one yeah. wants to sleep until 10 o'clock and half the day yeah. is gone. And there's all of these things. And and you learn if, if the one that you're traveling with is, is helpful and supportive and considerate or egoistic and uh, problem yeah. and uh, like you see if there's synergy or there's whatever the opposite of synergy is uh, yeah it, you know it's a very good test to to travel with someone or go to ikea it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did not know about that saying but it's it makes sense especially in denmark <laughs> yes um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are super curious about, okay, that's great. You have that idea, but how can you possibly finance this whole trip? And especially mm. thinking it's four years, but then ending up like nearly 10 years. How did mm. you manage that? Because you were not always able to work, I assume. No. So I, I, it's a really good question. The, the, the startup phase of, of all of it. And when I reflect upon it, I think it all comes down to the mindset that yeah. if you have the right mindset, then there are really no obstacles. You, you will always find a way. If, yeah. if it's money you need, you'll find the money. If it's a visa you need, you'll find a way to get the visa. If you need to get on board a ship, you'll find. So it's the mindset. It's not your nationality. It's not if you're a man or a woman. It's not if you have blue eyes or brown eyes. It's a, it's, that doesn't matter. It's your mindset. It's who you are as a person. And yeah. back in the startup phase, for me, once I set my mind, once I knew that this is what I wanted to do, um, I involved some friends and they helped me structure it. And they said, you know, if you want corporate financing, if you want sponsorship, if you want partners, then you need to, it, it has to look professional. It cannot just yeah. be you and a backpack and, hey, look at me, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, 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 you need to have maybe some graphics, you need to have some numbers, you need to have a plan, you need to, like, where are you going to start? Uh, yeah. Where are you going to go from the first country to the next country? And how are you going to connect? What's your plan to get between continents when they're not connected by land and you need to get on a ship? Uh, what kind of obstacles do you imagine you'll have? Um, what's the what's the overall time for this? If you're going to a company and you want a company to be involved, you cannot say I'm leaving home and I don't know when I'm coming back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, in time management, how there are, how many countries are there? Well, okay, so the United Nations says 193, but the Olympics has 206. So yeah. how many countries do you have in your project? And uh, how much time are you going to spend on average in each country? 
So we estimated seven days per country based on more or less 200 countries, and that should be four years. <laughs> and then the idea was I've been to Germany a hundred times, so mm -hmm. I don't need to spend a week in Germany. I can go spend one or two nights in Germany and then Netherlands. And yeah. then I've, I've been to the Netherlands a hundred times. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there are some yeah. countries you save time. There are small countries and you go fast. And if I want yeah. to come back to Germany or Netherlands or Finland or Norway or Sweden, I live in Denmark. It's very, <laughs> very easy to do. Maybe I should spend more time in Peru or in Argentina or in yeah. Mongolia, places where I don't know if I'm coming back and they're far away. Yeah. So in, in this sense, the time, the, the overall time for the project and the time management, put that in place. What are you asking a company for? So if you're asking for money, how much money are you asking for? So what's it going to cost? And yeah. then look into, well, what could be a reasonable budget for every country in the world, which is a crazy budget to have because... Singapore is very, very different in living costs compared to, I mean, Bolivia, yeah. maybe, right? So, yeah. so uh, how is that going to work out? But then you can reason, okay, what are your costs going to be? Say, so, well, you need food, okay? So, so you have costs for food, you need transportation, you're going to every country, of course, there's transportation, okay? So if you travel with public transportation, then maybe you save some money and there are different options. There's a budget option and so on. Okay. And uh, with food, yeah, well, if you're in Germany and you want to eat at restaurants, then your budget mm -hmm. is gone. But uh, <laughs> you can go to a supermarket and you buy some bread and some cheese and some whatever. And then you sit in a park and uh, you, you yeah. sit and have a little picnic and then that's okay right yeah. uh, so what else what else do you have you have your transportation you have your meals you also have accommodation where are you going to sleep well there are i'm sure there are many many options today online where you yeah. can find out uh, how to stay with a family or um with a collective or something like this <laughs> yeah. but but back in 2013 there was something called couch surfing and Ooh, yeah, couch surfing was an online platform and uh, and you search a city and uh, then you probably find a host and then they can offer that you can sleep on the floor or on the couch or maybe they have a guest bed and uh, it's a cultural exchange so the idea is not that you just find somewhere you can sleep for free you do. Yeah. You do find somewhere you can sleep for free. But the overall idea is that you meet somebody and you talk and maybe you go in for a walk in a park or down the street or you sit and have a beer. and Yeah, and learn something. Yeah, yeah. You learn something about the culture. You share and you receive. And yeah, it's, it's really nice. So I use that a lot in Europe. Um, and then there are visas, right? And mm -hmm. as long as you're... If you come from the EU and you're traveling in the eu <laughs> then that's pretty easy yeah um but yeah so those were the four costs that i isolated said well it's transportation accommodation visas and my meals and without that it will not function like you remove one of those then it it, it doesn't exist you need that that's the bare minimum then, of course, you have repairs or maybe you want to go and see a movie or you want yeah. to go inside a museum or something else. That's a different budget. But the, the minimum budget is those four elements. Yeah. And that could be $20 per day. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can also be $10 per day. It can also be $40 per day. But what I did was I estimated based on blogs and what other travelers did. You have some people with their bicycles and they have a tent and they cook their own meals and like yeah. this. And what is what kind of budget do they have? $20 or 20 euro um, seemed to be an OK. It's, it's, it's a tight reasonable. budget. Yeah, but it's, it's reasonable. So you're living on a rock. Uh, basically, <laughs> it's, uh, it's 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 very very basic budget, but at the same time, it's not too much money to ask for. Yeah. So it made it easier to find a partner that would provide. And 
I was lucky. So I thought about different companies I could contact. But essentially, my background was in shipping and logistics. And I had been working for a company in Denmark called Ross Engineering mm. for a long time. And uh, Ross Engineering today, they're called Ross Energy. And Ross Engineering, they had a focus on drilling. Um, yeah. So they could drill for oil or for gas. But their focus was really on geothermal energy. Yeah. So they drill for water and they create sustainable energy, which is a good thing. And I coordinated logistics for them on several projects. Yeah. But as a, as a consultant, so they would hire me for one project. And when there's no project, I go and work somewhere else. So I sent them an email and I told them that I wouldn't be able to work for them for the next four years. I said, if you have any projects for me the next six months, I'm happy to come and coordinate logistics. But uh, from October, then four years, I will not be available. Yeah. And they called me to the office and said, we need to talk. Ooh. And my first thought was, you're not my boss. You know, I'm a <laughs> consultant, you know. <laughs> Who do But, you think you are? <laughs> yeah. Who do you think you are? But at the same time, they probably gave me 90% of the work that I was doing. So yeah. <laughs> they were a very important client in my, my huge one-person company. Um, so I went and had a meeting and they were looking at me and saying, what are you talking about? Every country, no flying. Did you hit your head? Are you stupid? This is, what, what is this? And I was trying to defend and saying, no, no, this is amazing. This is logistics and bureaucracy on a high level. This is going to be an incredible adventure and it, this will inspire people and motivate people and I'm traveling as a goodwill ambassador of the Danish Red Cross and <laughs> this has never been done before it's world history and so on and then suddenly they were all laughing at me and they said this is <laughs> so so great we uh, have to be a part of this let us know how can we be a part of this oh, so it nice. was more like the financial sponsor came to me more than I came to the finance I was very lucky with that yeah. and they decided to cover the uh, the full budget And they did for about two years. Uh, then after two years, the company had some difficulties and they had to save money. And one place where they could save is a guy who's trying to reach every country <laughs> without flying. So, <laughs> so I, lost a, the, yeah, I lost the financial backing, which, uh, which was hard. But so many other hard things were happening. At the time, I was in Central Africa. I was recovering from malaria. My long-distance oh, wow. relationship wasn't really functioning very well. We had some big issues. Uh, there were so many checkpoints and so much bureaucracy and so much hardship. Yeah. And I was, I was breaking apart. I was mentally tired. I was in physical pain and mental pain. I, it, it, and then I got an email saying they can't sponsor anymore. I was like, I, I, that's, okay. that's the smallest of my problems. Yeah. So... Then I spent my own money from my savings and I took a loan and I took a second loan and then eventually crowdfunding. And then years later, Ross Energy came back and continued sponsoring again. So it's been a mix of different yeah. funding throughout the years, uh, corporates funding, uh, donations from my followers and private uh, funds as well. Yeah. But yeah, uh, an important thing in the planning process was to set a date. So that, that was, I know it sounds a little bit strange, but it was a little bit complex. Okay, I've decided I want to travel to every country in the world. When am I, am I leaving this afternoon? Am I leaving tomorrow? <laughs> am, am I leaving on Monday? When, yeah. when, when does this start? <laughs> when is a good time to start? Yeah. And uh, so, and, and once you have a date, you have something to work towards Yeah, yeah. Like then you can get more structured, even more structured and say, okay, that's everything has to be ready for this date. So yeah. my wife and I, we were training for the Berlin Marathon. Uh, my wife had already done three or four or five marathons and I had done right. two in the past. And this was an activity we wanted to do together. And we'd right. been training for six months. So we decided, okay, Let's do the marathon and then I leave after the marathon. And I think the marathon was in September, maybe. Yeah, I think probably September. And then I looked. So I said, okay, my legs are going to be tired. I don't want to start on tired yeah. legs. <laughs> so maybe after two weeks. And I looked in the calendar and I saw, okay, how about the 10th of October? The 10th of the 10th. 
Wow. And Good then date. I can start. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I said, then I can start at 10, 10 a.m. Then it will be 10, 10, 10, 10. How about oh. that? Okay, that's good. <laughs> so then I needed to work out, uh, do I need a website? What kind of social media? What about a project name? You should have a good name for the project. What's a good name? It's impossible to think of a good name. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> think of a good name for a project. You're going every country without flying. What's, the, yeah. what's it going to be? Like, I have no idea. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time on the name. Um, the content for the social media, uh, different project partners, and uh, what am I going to pack? Um, what am I going to wear? And yeah, and a uniform and all these things. And then eventually I was ready, and then the date came, and then I went. Perfect. Did you really leave at ten ten? Yeah. So I'll tell you what. <laughs> uh, we in in the south of Denmark, uh, very close to the German border, there's yeah. an old-fashioned windmill, like the ones that you know from the Netherlands. Yeah. And that windmill had historical significance in Denmark. There was actually a battle back in the day when we were constantly fighting with Germany. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, sometimes no. we would win and sometimes we would lose. But there was a big battle. And <laughs> I think that was the headquarters for the battle, uh, this windmill. And we lost that battle to Germany. And Germany <laughs> took a big part of Denmark. <laughs> so, and think, I'm sorry. Uh, no, well, uh, congratulations. Well done. Well done on winning that war. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that was in 1864, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a really long time ago. And then the Red Cross was founded in 1863, so the year before that battle. And that war between Denmark and Germany was the first war in history that the Red Cross was a part of. And the Red Cross was using that windmill also, uh, I believe, as a, a point of coordinating uh, humanitarian aid and helping the wounded soldiers and protecting civilians and so on. In, yeah. in 1864. So I thought, okay, that's that's a good place to start. I'll start there <laughs> because of the Red Cross significance and I'll start there because it's close to Germany and uh, <laughs> people know the place. And then my father was there and my childhood friend was there and some local media uh, came to film and uh, put me on TV, which was a big deal. And uh, <laughs> And they came, everyone was there early and were waiting for <laughs> 10, 10, right? Yeah. And then the phone, one of these uh, journalists, he gets a phone call. <laughs> and then he comes to me and he says, we need to go somewhere else. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. This is my big <laughs> press moment. I said, yeah, well, we can film it. It's not 10, 10 now, but we can film it now and pretend that it's 10, 10. <laughs> and I say, okay. And so then what my father <laughs> yeah yeah then my father and my childhood friend they make a countdown 10 9 8 7 uh, so, have a great journey my son okay we'll see you in 4 years take care be safe so, and i pretend that i'm walking away with my backpack and they film this and then they stop the camera and said you don't have to walk further that's good enough and then they say, we just want to ask you a few questions. And they put a microphone in my face and they say, <laughs> okay, why are you doing this? And what's going to go? And what's the da, 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 da. And then they pack up and they get in their bus and then they drive away. <laughs> and then my father is there and my childhood friend is there and I'm there. And it's still not 10 10. <laughs> so, so we're waiting a little bit and we're talking. And then when it's just before... 10, 10 in the morning, they count down again. 10, 9, 8, uh, <laughs> say, okay, and now it begins. And there's nobody else, just the three of us. And then, uh, and then my dad, he says, okay, now what? Is there a bus leaving at 10, 10 or what? Yeah. I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I, was just, I start on the 10th of the 10th at 10, 10 a.m. You know, that's, that's what it is. However so, that looks like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then I said, well, let's walk over to the bus stop. So we <laughs> we walk. It's a very short walk. We walk to the bus stop and we look and say, okay, the bus is coming in 15 minutes. Okay, we'll wait <laughs> another 15 minutes. So we're waiting and we're talking. And then the bus comes around the corner and it's mm -hmm. a typical yellow Danish bus. And up in the digital display, 
uh, up on top of the bus, it says bus number one. So I said, that's perfect. It doesn't get yeah. any better than that. And then <laughs> I get into the bus and my father takes a photo and my father, he, get, he waves goodbye and he gets in his car and he drives back home. And my childhood friend, he gets into his car and he follows the bus to the train station <laughs> and then at the train station i get a ticket and i have to wait half an hour for the train <laughs> and my and then i have like a second or a third farewell with my childhood friend and i get on the train <laughs> and the train takes me to germany and then i'm on my way that's so cool <laughs> and <Yeah>. funny <laughs> yeah. but it's kind of cool that you chose the spot where the battle was and then germany mm. is your first country that's kind of like yeah. makes sense so and uh, you know something that my wife said that i should remember to say more often <laughs> so i'll try to <laughs> say it now is a good moment that, <laughs> that when i reached germany for me that's the furthest i've ever been away from home so I could turn around and see Denmark, right? Yeah. But in a philosophical way, because I said I was not coming home until I reached the final country in the world, I now needed to visit every country in the world before I could return. So Denmark was right there. But the distance between me and Denmark was the greatest it has ever been in my life. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah isn't it? I love that. And she's right. You should say that more often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's a smart like, woman. Yeah, she Ultra knows. Ultra wifey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you used train, you used bus, you used cars, you used your feet. And yes. <laughs> what I find most impressive, you used like these massive container ships as well, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, that's right. So that was especially towards the end of the project. Yeah, where everything was more ocean. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But also the Pacific. So if if you grow up in Europe, then I think there's a high likelihood that you do not understand how big the Pacific is. Yeah. It, it, it's unbelievable distance between the island nations. And many of these countries are so small that it's yeah. it's almost a mystery how they were settled by people because the chances of missing those islands when they were sailing yeah. around are uh, they're, they're so small and so flat many of them are yeah. very flat uh, and you know you'd have to be almost at the island to see the island when you're coming with a ship yeah uh, but it's huge and sometimes you're on a ship for two weeks and you don't see anything else than ocean oh, God, and, uh, yeah. and then finally you get to a country Yeah, and have you ever felt like seasick or something? Because I'm sure I would. <laughs> Not on the big ships. Uh, the big ships generally move really slow from one side to the other or pitching forwards, backwards, and or they don't move at all. Sometimes yeah. they're just cutting through the ocean. You could, It feels like you're in, at a hotel. You have your, <laughs> your cabin, you have a bed and a table, and yeah. uh, you have a window. Um, a porthole it's called mm -hmm. and you have your toilet and your shower and you can sit there and read or watch a movie or sit and do whatever you want to do but yeah. you can forget you're on board a ship because the ship That's is good. sometimes not moving at all yeah. uh, the small boats they get me I've been <laughs> very very seasick <laughs> on some small boats very very seasick uh, <laughs> painfully seasick And the last time I was truly, truly seasick wasn't that long ago. It's, it's a year ago now, maybe. But I was in Vanuatu, which right. is a beautiful island nation in the Pacific. And really I had close arrived... to New Zealand, right? Yeah, it's relatively close to New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. And it's in the South Pacific. And I, a container ship brought me to uh one of the northern islands and my wife was coming to visit me somewhere in the middle of the island chain mm -hmm. and so i needed to go from the northern islands to the middle and i got on this local boat called big sister <laughs> <laughs> and uh and the weather was fine and the ocean was flat and i didn't take any seasickness tablets or anything <laughs> but also i didn't really have anything to eat and i was tired and so on so it was a bad combination yeah. 
I was a little bit dehydrated also. And I got on board and pretty quickly I got, I started to feel bad and I took some sea cichlids as tablets and I tried to sleep and I thought I was okay, but it got worse and worse. <laughs> and I had to run outside and then cross a lot of people sleeping on the floor and I had to jump between these people and over them. <laughs> and I was just thinking, I've got to throw up in a second. I hope I'm not going to throw up over all of these people <laughs> sleeping on the floor. Oh and I got God. to the side of the ship and I was throwing up and throwing up and throwing up. And then to the point where there's nothing more you can throw up. And I continue to throw up even though there's nothing. And it's just yeah. cramps and a oh, bad God. smell and bad taste and, and oh, all this God. horrible. And I couldn't go back inside. I was so sick I couldn't go inside. So I had to lie down outside on this <laughs> rusty deck. And there was oh, uh, water and cigarette, um, oh. you know, these cigarette buds and yeah. uh, garbage and it was really horrible and cold and oh, I was in pain <laughs> and every two or three minutes I had to throw up. And in the beginning, I heard people laughing. <laughs> and I, I think they thought it was funny, like the, the, the European guy. on, on the boat. And, yeah, exactly. But after some time, nobody was laughing and people, they came to me and uh, this one guy, he put his hand on my back and he was like, like you would do with a child. And he was like... Yeah like trying to comfort me and go like, D are you okay? And someone came with a bottle of water and they were trying to help me. Yeah. So I stayed out all night and, <laughs> and, and sometimes the waves would come over the side of the boat and hit me <laughs> on my face. <laughs> and so now I was, I was wet and I was cold and I was in pain and throwing up and it was oh so, so, so terrible. So yes, Sometimes I get seasick, uh, but generally I think that I have found out that if I'm not physically exhausted and if I'm not sleepy and if I have had enough to eat and if I'm well hydrated, yeah. then I do not get seasick. <laughs> but if you remove all of that, then maybe I get seasick. Yeah, fair enough. It reminds me on one trip I had once when I wanted to see dolphins. And yeah. I didn't take anything because I thought I'm fine. I wasn't. I had the worst sunburn in my face because I was just laying on the deck and I couldn't <laughs> move and I was throwing up. Oh, yeah. yeah. It really reminds me Terrible. of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, was talking... once, I, was, I was once seasick for four days on oh, board oh. a sailboat from Senegal to Cape Verde. And uh, again... I'd been on a lot of boats and I thought that I was uh, some superhero or something like this. And I thought that nothing would happen. And after half an hour on board, I started to get sick. And I was sick for four days and I didn't get any food or anything to oh my drink. God. Or I did get food and something to drink, but it came out two seconds later, right? So my body didn't get food or anything to drink for four days. I was so weak, so, so, so weak when we got to... I, it, just walking maybe 10 or 20 steps, then I would have oh, to God. stop. And I was out of breath, like if I had been running 10 kilometers really fast. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> that does not sound <laughs> enjoyable. But since we no. are talking about not enjoyable things, in all no. these years, obviously, it's your big adventure. And it probably has a million great moments. And you must have met so many amazing people along the way but mm. what was some of the hardest parts you had to endure and you were thinking okay maybe I can't do it because I've heard that sometimes you were thinking maybe I just don't finish it mm. but then your willpower was like no this is your thing you do that but what were the moments where you were like I think I shouldn't do it maybe I might die or yeah. What was your experience there? Well, there are, there are so many different levels of wanting to give up or reasons why there, there's been a lot of loneliness in a project like this and mm. the kind of loneliness that you feel from being misunderstood um, or being different from everyone yeah. else um, not necessarily being alone, sometimes you're surrounded by people, but still feeling alone. Then there has been 
just the fatigue the i can't do this anymore i can't live out of a bag anymore i i, I want I, this it's pointless nobody cares nobody yeah. cares about what i'm doing <laughs> like why am i still doing it the things that i'm trying to achieve am i really achieving them it does is it having yeah. a real impact am i reaching enough people like and then yeah. you have this voice in your head then the malaria was uh, uh, like a really hard hitter. Um, I had cerebral malaria. I was very sick for a couple of weeks taking medication. And, uh, and then a week after that, trying to gain, regain strength, enough strength yeah. to carry my bag. I was so weak, I couldn't carry my bags. And then my hands were still shaking. I started getting migraines uh while in central africa i've never had a migraine in my entire life and then suddenly <laughs> bang i had oh, one God. and i this is the wow. first time i learned learned what a migraine was <laughs> I, <laughs> you really I get to was, know yourself <laughs> yeah i thought it was a headache i thought a yeah. migraine was a headache because it's pain in your head so and the yeah. only experience i had was a headache so i thought okay it's a bad headache but no 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 it's it's like your head is splitting in two halves and an oh. alien is coming out and you're probably going to die <laughs> it, 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 it's it's unbelievable pain it's yeah. it's so so bad and i started having these migraines uh, while i was battling all of the bureaucracy and the logistics in central africa all the checkpoints yeah. and the paperwork and it, it was hard then i was at gunpoint at uh, one point in uh, in the same region in, in central africa i was in the south of cameroon close yeah. to congo on a dirt road in the jungle in the middle of the night so it was dark and it was dusty and i was in a taxi together with a driver and we come to a checkpoint with uh, three uniformed men and they're drunk out of their mind and uh, they they're armed to the teeth like they and they yeah. were, were very aggressive and it was a very very hostile environment it was very very unpleasant and they command us out of the vehicle and we get out of the taxi and then they see that I'm European. Oh, and, and, I mean, if if people don't know, then uh, Africa has a lot of history with Europeans, and yep. the, most of it is not positive. And in in that moment, I was the cause of all. I was the root yeah. of all, all the, the evil of yeah. every <laughs> European colony. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Cameroon was a German colony um, <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> so, but, but but it it, it changed into a British and uh, and French colony over time, yeah. and then they got their independence. But anyway, so there I was, and it was dangerous and um, violent and hostile, and I was sure I was going to die. I I knew I was going to die. I, That's I, crazy. I, I, I served three years in the military. I've been in many different situations. I have a lot of knowledge and training. Yeah. I, at, at that point, I'd been traveling for two years through almost 100 countries and I traveled a lot in Africa already. I've seen a lot. That yeah. moment was the scariest. That, that was the moment I thought, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right now. Not in one hour. I'm going to die in 10 seconds or I'm going to die yeah. in two minutes but I'm going to die now. And I thought there are different ways that I could die, but for sure they would shoot me. This I knew, but <laughs> there are different, different reasons how I could get shot. So in my assessment, because it was so out of control and because they were so drunk, they could shoot me by accident, right? Yeah. They, they, were, they were not pointing the guns in the ground or in, up to the sky. They were pointing at me, right? And they were very very drunk and very very angry so there's all this emotion and all this so by yeah. accident they could shoot me like someone could like trip over a rock or sneeze or <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what and then i'm dead then another way i could get shot is by passion like someone is just not thinking they're really angry really drunk and then they go like, ah this guy and then da -da 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 -da, and then yeah. it's over or i could die calculated like one of them could say, you know, the best thing in this situation is to kill him and throw him in the forest and he's gone, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it, it could be like a decision. So yeah. two ways where it could just be like 
passion or an accident. And then one word could be a decision. Okay, let's shoot him. Uh, but I knew I was going to die. And I was very, very scared. And I was trying to do the best in the situation. No fast movements, no sudden movements, yeah. not turning my back to them, not walking away, uh, answering every question as well as I can, trying no debating, no debating at all, no yeah. just passive, be as passive as possible. Give them, if they ask for my passport, give it. If they ask for an invitation letter, give it. If they ask for a vaccination card, give it. Get, like Whatever they want, give it. Give it, give yeah. it, give it. And um, yeah, and, and I think I was lucky. I, I mean, so easily I could have died that day. But uh, one hour later, they let us go. And so you could say, okay, just one hour. But one hour is a long time when you oh, think every I second you're bet. going to die. Yeah, I would probably um, <laughs> shit my pants. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I, I almost did. And uh, <laughs> so they, they let us go. And uh, I don't know why. Yeah. Nothing changed. Only time passed, but nothing changed. Then and suddenly they let us go. And uh, we got into the taxi and we drove as fast as we could down the road. And we continued into the darkness, into the night. And after two or three kilometers, I told the driver to stop. And I opened the door and I got out. There was a big rock. And I sat behind that rock and I crouched down and I was just shaking, shaking, shaking. And then after maybe 10 minutes, I came back to the car and I said, okay. Let's, we let's can go. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, that's an incredible story. Like so scary, but also incredible. And we always say, and I don't know how it is in English, but we say you had a really good safety guard, like a guardian angel mm, who was yes, like looking maybe. over you. <laughs> yeah, oh God. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that's uh, three of the ships I've traveled on board are confirmed to be at the bottom of the sea. So that's a different kind of, of danger. And after that checkpoint, I was at gunpoint again after 12 hours or something like that. But it In was, Africa again. Yeah, the, the same after 12 hours, the, ex, the same region, you know, this <laughs> oh time in Congo. So I crossed the border and this time I was at gunpoint in Congo, but, but not as scary. It was in yeah. the daytime and uh, the soldiers did not have the finger on the trigger. And they were not drunk, or maybe not very drunk, at least. <laughs> drunk. The thing was that this was New Year's Eve. So the night that I met these guys, uh, people were partying and they were drunk and uh, this kind of stuff. And then when I got to Congo, everyone had a hangover and some people were still drinking a little bit and this kind of stuff. Yeah. But that was it was so much more... Like it's it's never a hundred percent safe if you're yeah. together with someone and they're pointing a weapon at you, uh, but it felt a lot safer in the situation. And then twenty four hours after that, I was in a vehicle uh, <laughs> together with uh, eight or ten other people, like a really packed vehicle full of uh, cargo and suitcases, and and we're going really fast, maybe 80, 90 kilometers per hour down a dirt road through a jungle. And uh, people are falling asleep. And I'm in the back seat and yeah. everyone is falling asleep around me. And uh, then suddenly the driver falls asleep also. And <laughs> with all of this speed and then the car starts to go off the side of the road and I throw myself forward and I grab the steering wheel oh, and I break back and i'm on the back seat remember that's so on the back seat with yeah. the steering wheel trying to get us up on the road and that this wakes the driver up so he wakes up and he's angry with me because i have my hand on the steering wheel yeah, but then you? <laughs> he realizes what happened and he just uh, nods i go like okay in acceptance and then he didn't fall asleep again and there you know there are no seat belts there's no airbag uh, no safety probably, <laughs> Probably no ambulances, uh, clinics, yeah. hospitals are not up to code in, in that part of the world. Like if, if we went off the road, this car would flip and, and half of us would be dead immediately, I imagine. And maybe the rest of us would die slowly um, without any treatment. Yeah. Well, congratulations on actually finishing that mission. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> But here, you know, there's an important point to be made when we talk about these things, 
that this is over the course of almost 10 years. We are talking every country in the world. We're talking a distance which is the same as if you go from planet Earth to the moon. That's how far I traveled. It's 382,000 kilometers, right? So it's it's nine and a half times around the planet, uh, to put it in perspective. Something's going to happen. You know, yeah. and and most of the time when these things happen, it's because I made a bad decision. Like I was in a taxi in the middle of the night. I yeah. I should have gone in daytime, right? Um, yeah. I should have informed someone where I was going. And you know, you can you can do different things to protect yourself a little better. But then yeah. also, the main point for me would be that if we talk about the bad things, we can talk for a few hours because there have been some bad things, right? But if we talk about the good things, we have to talk for months, you know? Exactly. Do you have one situation or one moment you remember and you thought like, this is my favorite moment and I will always remember that? I mean, of course, you will remember everything is like the greatest adventure of your life. But was there one particular one where you were like, this really stands out? This is really the moment I felt like, the most wholesome, happy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay, so the last thing you said about the most wholesome and most happy, then I would maybe change my answer to the moment when I came out of Equatorial Guinea. That was my country number 100. And that was, at the time, the hardest country for me to get to. I spent three months and in those three months those stories i just told you about being at gunpoint the first time the second time and the car uh, all of that happened in those three months and the checkpoints and going between different countries and being denied not in nice ways like being shouted at that you're yeah you'll never get a visa (laughs) 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 Um, so that was a rough time so it took three months to get the visa and then one month to get permission to cross the border so yeah. I have the visa, but they still don't allow me to cross the border for <laughs> one month. Oh, no. uh, so when I came out of Equatorial Guinea, I was there for two days. I had this encounter with a chimpanzee and it reached for my hat and its nail hit just below my eye. It hit my cheek and I had like this scratch on my mm. cheek. And uh, so I have a photo of me on a small truck back in, <laughs> back in Gabon uh after coming out of equatorial guinea and there are like three or four other people in the back of the truck and there are bananas and maybe some (laughs) other fruits and vegetables and we're on a dirt road and the sun is shining on my face and i have like the biggest smile and i have this scratch on my (laughs) cheek and that that was a great great moment of victory and happiness and everything is is very good and very nice that's really cool. But now I'm really intrigued. What would have been your first answer without I, like... Uh, well, so I had I have this experience where I was in Congo and I needed to travel between two different cities. And it was a crazy time in Congo. It was, uh, they had a referendum and uh, people were trying to escape the, the capital. They, a lot of people were worried that there would be some unrest that people would go in the streets and there would be some violence and maybe some people would die and this this kind of stuff. So people were trying to escape. And this meant that all the buses and all the taxis and the trains and the airplanes as well, that doesn't relate to me, but all the ordinary forms of transportation were fully booked and gone. Yeah. There was no option for me uh, except there was a truck. And uh, there was this uh, Congolese Uh woman who saw me and we teamed up. So we decided to travel together and she could help me a little bit and maybe I could protect her a little bit and so on. So she organized that we could get on top of this truck. And we were 50 or 60 people on top of the truck. Half the truck was full of cargo and the other half was just people standing up. And I was one of the people sitting on top of the cargo. So like very five meters up or something like this <laughs> and then we drive through the city and people are pointing at me and waving and they think it's so funny to see me like everyone mm-hmm. else is that's kind of normal right but yeah. me on top of that truck it's hey look at him <laughs> and it's really nice and fun for 
10 minutes or 20 minutes and then yeah. it's not nice anymore. <laughs> it was very uncomfortable to sit on top of the truck. Very, very uncomfortable. Everything is moving around. And there's yeah, no nice position and you yeah. start to feel pain in your legs and in your body. The sun was really, really harsh. Yeah. Uh, there was We drove on this dirt road and uh, there was so much dust. <laughs> like you, you got that dust in your eyes, in your ear, in your in, in your nose, of course, in your mouth and yeah. in your your hair, and it's just completely like I'm I'm from Europe, so you don't see the dust so much on my face. But yeah. you look at everyone else on that <laughs> truck, they, they, you could see the dust for sure. So <laughs> so we're driving and everybody's miserable. Nobody's talking. Nobody's having a good time. Everyone's just <laughs> not enjoying being on that truck. Everybody wants to get off, but this is transportation. And we're go going through a very beautiful landscape, but nobody's enjoying it. It's just miserable. Yeah. And then it's evening time and the sun is setting. And then a woman next to me, she has a plastic bottle and she starts to hit this plastic bottle in a rhythm. Yeah. And then she starts to sing. And it sounds so beautiful. It's in a language I don't know, but she starts yeah. to sing. It sounds very beautiful. And then very quickly, another woman starts to sing. And then a man. And then soon the entire truck oh, is singing. Wow. Everybody knew this song. And so I don't know what the song was, but everybody yeah. knew the song and they're singing in a language I don't understand. And it's so powerful and it's yeah. so beautiful. And the sun is setting and there's dust everywhere. And it made the sunset even more beautiful. And yeah. the landscape was really magical. And I'm on top of a truck in Congo. And, yeah. You know, there, there was a good 15 minutes where it was just perfect. Yeah. It was so unique and it was yeah. so, so, so memorable. Yeah. I love that. And then <laughs> the sun set and it got dark and everyone stopped singing and then everyone mm. was miserable again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was on top of that truck for two days. Oh, wow. I can't imagine yeah. doing that, honestly. But no, of course, it's like really burning into your memory if you have miserable feeling and it's for two days and then you have that moment where everything seems right the sun and then everyone chanting or singing that's really beautiful yeah. Yeah. it was very special it's one of those things that even if you're a millionaire you cannot buy an experience no. like that yeah i think that's what is so intriguing for me as well to hear that and i think i could talk to you for hours i could sit <laughs> watching a fire and just talk 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 it's just so unbelievable interesting and um okay. is there anything you would think you would recommend someone who would say oh i love that it inspires me it's so extraordinary i want to do that too is there anything you would tell that person <laughs> I, I I think that we should be open to other people and we should be open to opportunities. I think that just in general, there are opportunities all around us. There are so many opportunities around you today in New Zealand and so many opportunities around me today here in Denmark. And yeah. we're not going to take most of these opportunities. We're, maybe we're not even going to see them. But yeah. the world is just full of opportunities. So I think When you're traveling, especially, you should be open to people and open to taking those opportunities. But you should not be blind. Like you should understand that we're living in a world where most people are helpful and friendly and kind. By far, most people. Uh, I like to say that when you're dealing with people, it's uh, like dealing with uh, a reversed lottery. So you're yeah. winning every time, pretty much. Um, of course you can lose, but you're almost always winning, but be open to those opportunities and then you'll have some great adventures and some fantastic encounters. Yeah. And I'm sure you had some really amazing encounters on the way. I can just yeah. imagine because me just traveling for a short time, I have met so amazing people with so amazing stories and it's so inspiring and you just traveled the whole world so yeah by seeing every single country and i know you haven't spent in every single country heaps of time sometimes more sometimes less yeah but 
is there anything you feel like we as humans could do now since you have um, really encountered so many different cultures where you would say, okay, if we would all do a certain thing or something to make the world a better place, is there anything you feel like after seeing it all, I would really want us all to think about that, consider this, um, do this, how can we make this world a better place? Yeah, I I, I think that some of these like very social socialistic and um, almost hippie like concepts <laughs> they are they are true that there is an there's an element to pay it forward yeah. there's an element to be kind to people there's an element to looking at someone who's being really rude or really stupid or uh, someone who's not behaving in in a nice way and trying to understand why are they not just reacting to, I don't like you because you said that, but trying to understand why did they say that? That is that because they had a bad day that they received some really bad news so that they lose someone that they love, you know, yeah. you, we really don't know why people, they react. You can have someone who's good almost every day. And then one day they're angry. <laughs> and, yeah. and if you meet that person when they're angry, then something happened for sure to break the pattern. And yeah. we need to have that tolerance and understand that none of us are going to be the best, our best self uh, yeah. every day, all the time. And if it's true about ourselves, then it's true about other people too. So have tolerance and understanding. And that tolerance goes to belief as well. If someone wants to believe that the planet is flat, I mean, you can laugh at them and you can debate them. You can say, I can never be friends with you, but does it matter? Does it matter that if you think the planet is round and they think it's flat, does it matter? Like, is that if they are sensible people on every other topic and if they're nice to talk to and they're helpful, does it matter that they believe the planet is flat? Does it matter if someone believes that there are millions of gods and someone believes there's one God and someone believes there's no God? Does yeah. it matter? You know, yeah. we can we not have different ideas and, and still come together be, and yeah we we are you know it's it's very much that you're you're in a small boat and you have this expression we're all in the same boat but we are we're on the same planet and yeah. if 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 we're massively polluting in one country it doesn't stop at the borders you know yeah, yeah. If, if if there's a hole in the ozone layer and we're getting radiation <laughs> like this is is everybody's like we have if there's a meteorite coming to earth if there's a global pandemic if there's uh, fires popping up everywhere if temperatures yeah, yeah. are rising like this is this is not you you can't point at one country and say it's your fault or maybe yeah. you can but but we all but have to react to the reality. Well, but we all have to react to reality. And yeah. there's, there's never going to be synergy if we don't work together. There, it's yeah. impossible to have synergy alone. There's no synergy alone. Synergy yeah. is when we work together. And synergy is a real thing. You know, this is when, yeah. when, when you get so much more out of your, your joint efforts. So we yeah. need to collaborate. We need to be tolerant. And it's super hippie-ish to say things like that. <laughs> but this it's is what true. works. It works in a family. It works at a school. It works at a workplace. You know, of course, it also works globally. It has to work globally. So, yeah. and, and maybe the most important thing I can say is that when you leave your home, yeah. then you become a guest. So everywhere you go, which is not your home, may, then you're a guest. And yeah. when you're a guest, it's your job to be on your best behavior, not be condescending, not point and say, oh, we do things differently where I come from. We do it in a better way or you're idiots or this. Yeah, yeah. like you, you have to be polite. You have to be understanding. And sometimes you need to let things slip. Sometimes yeah. you need to not attack everything. Not everything has to be a war or a battle. Yeah, that's a really good answer. Keeping it really short, how would you think has this journey impacted you and changed you as a person? Well, I'm a different person uh, than I was when I left home. And I'm trying to see if I can remember who the heck I was <laughs> when I left home. But it's it's not just 10 years. It's, it's 10 years of uh, 
all this incredible volume of information of culture and history and meeting different people and seeing and listening and smelling and touching and i i really feel that i've i'm on if you look at my passport i'm 44 yeah but i i really feel like i'm much much older than 44 <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it has certainly changed me in that way that i i have a lot of life experience and uh, I'm trying to reflect on on that. A different way it has changed me is the way that I view the world, but that's through the life experience, right? Uh, I say a core thing that has changed is my belief in that if I set my mind to something, yeah. if I really want something, I believe I can have it. Yeah. Um, I, there's, I've been through so much to achieve this goal that when people say... When people tell me something is impossible, I smile. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, I can prove you wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, I know I can prove them wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's also a really great answer. Thank you so much. I always finish every episode with the quick three questions. So it's pretty much okay. just trying to answer with one word or one sentence. So that is okay. like kind of intuitive. So yeah, fireman, hey, uh, yellow, pasta, <laughs> cheese. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here are your quick three questions. Number one, okay. seeing all the countries, which country could you imagine living in, or you thought like, oh yeah, this is a really great country. If I ever choose to not live in Denmark anymore, then I'd say Iceland. Iceland. Wow. Do you yeah. like the cold? Well, Iceland can also be warm. It depends on the, the season. The time. Yeah, I, yeah. I, Iceland, very short, I could say. Iceland is just amazing. It's a modern country. It's more village mentality than it's a small population, right? Yeah. It's, it's very beautiful. It's full of adventure. So there, there are a lot of good things going for Iceland. It's a very sustainable country in terms of energy. But the main thing about Iceland for me is a mentality that they have that I haven't really seen anywhere else. That in pretty much every country, when you're born, you're put on the conveyor belt of life. And then you need to clean your room and help your mother. And you go to yeah. school, you do your homework. And then eventually you get an education and you get a career and you meet someone and you start a life and you start a family and you pay your bills and you grow old, you pay your pension, you take your pension and then you die. That's the plan. <laughs> and that's what everybody is told to do. And if you're a dreamer, if you want to be a rock star or if you want to be a top athlete or if you want to be an author or if you want to be anything which is outside of the conveyor belt of the safety of the plan, yeah. Then your parents will tell you, don't. Your parents will say that it's unsafe. Do you know that how many people go to Hollywood and how few people become a yeah, famous yeah. Uh, actor? Yeah. So, yeah. so they will tell you, go with the safe plan, the education and the job and the career. And then you have it as your hobby. And if you're really good at it, then maybe, who knows, then something yeah. can come from it. But don't put all your eggs in that basket. Yeah. In Iceland, I feel that... Like, it's not a general thing that everyone's just trying to be a rock star. This, But I feel that there's yeah. more of a tolerance and there's a lot more support in society that if you want to be something else out of the ordinary, then people say, okay, let's see if we can make it happen. And yeah. I really like that about Iceland. Now I really feel like I really want to go to Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been, so I'm, I'm still having a long list of countries I want to see. So Iceland yeah. moves a little up, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, bring money. It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number two. What did you miss the most about your home country, Denmark? Milk. That's a really interesting answer. <laughs> like well, here's, a here's, the, here's the thing. Um, I found great milk. All around the world. I like milk in general. And, yeah. and I found great milk. And so many countries have fresh milk and good milk and nice milk and so on. But I think it relates to what do you think milk is supposed to taste like? And you probably think milk is supposed to taste like it did when you were a child. 
Yeah. So if you were a child in New Zealand or in Austria or in who knows where, then that's how milk is supposed to taste. And yeah. then milk can be good anywhere, but it doesn't taste right. Yeah. And and it's impossible to get Danish milk outside of Denmark. <laughs> I mean, you get powder milk maybe, but but yeah. you know you you get that in Denmark. I can get Danish. Uh, bread or I can get Danish uh, liver pate or Danish uh, home cooked dishes many places around the world and I really can't taste the difference between if I had that in Denmark or if I had it in uh, Uganda but but the milk I miss the taste of Danish milk yeah I I kind of agree on the whole part of it tastes like milk is for you what you experienced when you were a child And here mm. in New Zealand, I think people would think like we have the best milk here ever, yeah. fresh from the cow. <laughs> and I would think like that's not milk. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would get that tetra pack of milk, which is like all treated, and that's milk for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel you. All right. Last question. If you could describe your whole journey, the whole experience with just one word, which would it be? Determination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I'm another word, another word, which well, I might want to use. Maybe I want to use that instead. I would say education. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's it's it is very much both though. But if I can only choose one word, okay, I'll say education because <laughs> you, even determination really, has been yeah. an education. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I bet you learned a lot about yourself, about other people, about other countries and cultures, and probably also about your wife. <laughs> so many things. It's been a full education for sure. Yeah. Well, Thor, it's been a great conversation. And as mentioned before, I could probably talk for hours, but I'm also trying to be really thoughtful about your time because you were really, really um, nice in offering so much time. So um, it's been yeah. a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I, I really feel like if I'm back visiting my family in Germany and if I ever then end up going to Copenhagen. I might even just text you and hope that you still have my number and might just come over to meet Ultra Wifey and um, to yeah. hear some more stories because I'm sure there's like, yeah, unlimited amount of stories, which I would love to hear. Well, sure. <laughs> That would be very nice. And I'm sure she would like to meet you too. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much for being here. And I hope that everyone who's listening is enjoying it as much as I did. So everyone Thank have you. a really good time. And um, yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>